everyone and uh, it's a great pleasure to have you all here uh, i hope the effort and the excitement which you have uh, taken to be here this morning would be worth your while we have uh, a very interesting uh, session and a very eminent speaker for this uh, session here who's probably visiting india for the first time i think yeah okay all right um i would uh, also like to introduce the dignitaries on the dais before we start this program uh, at the extreme uh, left we have mr ketan sangvi who is the honorary treasurer of International Textile Machinery Exhibition Society, that is ITME Society, who's hosting this program today. Uh, next to him, we have Mr. Hari Shankar, Chairman of India ITME Society. And uh, in the center, we have former Chief Justice of India, Sri P. Sadashivam, and he's also the former governor of Kerala. May I uh, request a big uh, round of applause. <laughs> we are uh, very humbled and we are very grateful, sir, for you joining us this afternoon. Um, and then we have the speaker of uh, this session, Professor Gloy from Germany. A big round of applause. Um, India uh, ITME Society is uh, a 40-year-old non-profit industry body which work, works towards promoting and uh, facilitating the textile and textile engineering industry in India with our work uh, uh, which we do through all our associates and friends uh, all over the world. Uh, and we are, as an organization, completing 40 years of service in India. And uh, this initiative of connecting with the students, uh, uh, an effort towards disseminating the knowledge, because so far we have been working towards technology, innovations, uh, sharing the latest technology, machinery, information with the industry. And completing 40 years, we are also looking at connecting with the future and the next generation, next generation which would be helpful and motivating and encouraging for the students who are pursuing the textile courses. We are also making efforts to connect them with overseas universities. Maybe uh, they can pursue some courses further or also, the, uh, also we are trying to uh, invite uh, eminent uh, research uh, uh, researchers and uh, professors from overseas universities so that the students can uh, familiarize themselves with what is going on in the other side of the world. Uh, may, I, uh, may I request Chairman Mr. Hari Shankar and Mr. Ketan Sangvi, Honorary Treasurer, now to uh, formally welcome our guest for the day, respected Sir Sadashwar. <laughs> sir, a very small token of our regard and respect for you. May I request uh, Chairman and Treasurer to welcome Professor Gloy. We also have a uh, uh, very experienced and well-respected uh, teacher from Moi University, Kenya, Professor Jospat, and requesting Chairman and Treasurer to uh, extend a warm welcome to him with a small memento. Good morning, one and all. It's my pleasure to stand before you at the start of our 
very special celebration over a two-day period of our 40th year of India Ethnic Society. First of all, a special welcome to our chief guest for the day, former Chief Justice of India, Governor of Kerala, Sri P. Sadashivam, for all his effort to make it to our event. Uh, thank you very much for coming all the way, sir. And despite all the inconveniences with delayed flights and all of that, he's finally made it here. Um, good morning and warm welcome to everyone gathered here today, dignitaries and delegates from all around the world, professors and students from the uh, textile universities. First of all, it's a very welcoming sign to see such a turnout in response to our um, session here this morning, uh, which goes to say the future of the industry is very bright. With um, uh, It's very heartwarming to see young minds um, gathered here today, eager and keen to um, glean information from the esteemed uh, speakers that we have today. Very warm welcome to um, Professor Yves Simon Groy, Archen University um, of Textile Technology, Germany. And he is going to share with us his um, presentation on digitization and sustain sustainability, which happen to be two drivers um, that are important in the um, textile industry today. Also, very warm welcome to uh, Professor Josfat from Moy University, and he's going to have a um, short presentation uh, later this morning as well. As um, uh, I have a quote here from uh, Dalai Lama, which says, sharing your knowledge is a way to immortality. And uh, uh, as I mentioned, it's really, welcoming sign to see um, a lot of you gathered here today so that uh, we can take the messages delivered by our um, keynote speakers uh, uh, this morning. Uh, later this morning, um, uh, we will be joined by uh, Mrs. Uh, Swati Pandey, who happens to be the um, Postmaster General, Mumbai region, who will um, give us a presentation about the um, uh, commemorative uh, stamp that's going to be released uh, later this evening on behalf of um, India Etme Society celebrating the 40th year. So once again, um, a very warm and cordial welcome to all delegates and dignitaries and invited guests from all over the world. Um, Welcome to all our students and faculty from the Textile Institutes, and uh, hopefully we'll have a very productive and informative um, session here this morning. Thank you. Further uh, sharing a few information about India ITME Society. The society was formed uh, 40 years back uh, by a joint uh, effort and vision of five industry uh, organizations, uh, such as uh, International Indian Textile Machinery and Accessories uh, Association, uh, Textile Machinery Manufacturers Association, uh, Textile Association of India, Confederation of Indian Textile Industry, and Bureau of Indian Standard Government of India. Uh, one of uh, the key members, uh, that is uh, the textile accessories and machinery uh, manufacturers association, uh, also is very active and one of the largest uh, organization representing the industry segment in India. And uh, they also uh, have various activities for the members and one of one of the activities is a, a very informative magazine, Itama Voice, which uh, is to be launched uh, today uh, before you. May I uh, request uh, Mr. Uh, Matre, 
Director General to introduce the idea and invite Mr. Anand, who is also a board member on India ITME Society, as well as Governor of Itama, Mr. Matri. Thank you, uh, Madam. Good morning and uh, welcome to all the guests. Uh, due to unavoidable circumstances, uh, Mr. Jugal Kishore Pansari, our president, is not able to make up today, but he has sent a message for uh, this event. Uh, I'll just read out for you. Respected dignitaries on the dais and my dear friends, students, it is my distinct honor and high privilege to be the part of this very important event on behalf of ITAMA and India ITME Society. I take this opportunity to convey my heartiest congratulations to India ITME Society and especially the chairman, Mr. Hari Shankar, honorary treasurer, Mr. Ketan Sangui, and executive director, Ms. Seema Srivastava, for organizing this most valuable event, being the need of the hour in the present scenario of digital marketing and digital manufacturing. On behalf of ITAMA and my own, I thank India ITME Society for providing us this valuable platform for releasing the seventh volume of our ITAMA Voice, a quarterly print publication. Our each ITAMA issue is being developed under a specific theme, keeping in space with the latest trends being followed in the textile industry, maybe a technological development or business growth. I am pleased and happy to mention that this particular issue is focused on innovation, the need of the hour, shall prove to be a most appropriate for today's event, Academy Industry Connect. Now may I request uh, Mr. R. Anand, our Governor of ITAMA and past President, to please uh, come and uh, release the ITAMA voice. Our nation, India, is enriched by the vision, guidance, mentoring of many, uh, many people uh, in this country. The next generation always shall remain blessed. And uh, when we receive words of wisdom from them, get nurtured by them. We had great leaders like Abdul Kalam, who was very dedicated to, towards uh, motivating, encouraging, mentoring students. Uh, it was very dear to his heart. We today are very blessed to have our former Chief Justice P. Sadashivam, who's made landmark judgments for our country influencing the future of our generations and changing the course of the history for our nation. Sir, the students from various institutes and universities are here. It would be a great, great opportunity for all of them to hear two words from you. Dignity is all the dais, up the dais, respected invitees from all over the world, my lovable students. As per the program, my actual work comes in the evening. After breakfast, I was informed that the session is, uh, morning session starts with, it is a technical session. Experts in this field are going to address and uh, I conveyed that I will also spend some time. That is the reason now, now I am standing before you. And uh, I have something to convey to the leaders of this field, as well as the students. As a person hailing from my background is judiciary, by my experience as a judge of the two high courts and finally, Supreme Court and retired as a Chief Justice of India. 
I want to share my views relatable to our uh, this uh, conference, particularly the business in the evening session. Since now I am on the dais, Madam has requested to address for two minutes. And particularly for uh, students sitting here, it is an opportunity to associate with the experts like the business magnates. They are sitting in the first 10 rows. Uh, they are facing uh, several problems day to day life, like us. Everyone has some problem. They are also it is an opportunity to share and discuss and find out the solutions. And I am uh, thankful to the president of this uh, conference, Mr. Harishankar. Maybe he might have chosen, he, he hails from Coimbatore district, from Tamil Nadu. Now I also come from the same district, only difference, he represents uh, business, group, I come from farming community. After retirement, I refuse to stay at Delhi and I want to continue my farming. That's why I... <laughs> of course, after retirement, I spent five more years as a first citizen of a state, namely Kerala. I enjoyed that tenure. And at the appropriate time, uh, in the evening, in the evening session, I will uh, uh, convey my views to the, all of our, uh, the friends in the industry as well as the other participants. So with this, I conclude my address. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. And I invite uh, Mr. Avinash Mayakar to uh, share the theme of the event followed by the presentation uh, uh, of Dr. Gloy. Good morning, all. First of all, warm welcome to the African delegates, all industry stalwarts, and my good, lovely friends from the education institutes. As far as India ITMA is concerned, we are having different types of portfolios. It was well known for many years, only as an exhibition institute. Thanks to the new team, which has taken it across the border, we'll be having now India, it may Africa 2020 in February. So for exhibitions, it was well-known institute. We have started now events. Yesterday, we were having business to business meetings, B2B meetings with African delegates and Indian industry. Similarly, there are many other initiatives which are taking place already taken place and now in future also we have so many fruits in our basket. Trade promotion services, that is another portfolio which we are using. And today especially we want to focus on the education related issues. We also have education scholarships by ITME Society. Placement to the students, that is the another big vision which we have. So that the way few institutes, they are having almost 100% placement. This, this was told to me by my VJTI professors. Similarly, we want that each and every student who is passing out from the textile institute should get a job and preferably in textile industry only. Why? I will talk about it later. And then consultancy. We find that most of the people in India are not finding their vision, are lacking as far as devising their roadmap is concerned. So we will help them out in doing that, as well as product presentations, marketing tools across the borders, how we can take it, that will be taken care by India ITME Society. Just to give you a brief about what we do, there is, we have already started e-library, thanks to all education institutes who have helped us, and the research associations, as well as COEs, who have partner with us on this particular initiative. And another thing is placement assistance, as I told you, we want to bridge the gap in between the industry and the education. Similarly, a lot of conferences will be happening through us, through our initiatives, to take care of knowledge sharing. Whatever innovation is happening in the world, 
that should come to us, to our students and to our industry. This is what is the ultimate goal which we are talking of. If at all we see total our exports and imports, if we see Indian trade, we are just at 5%, whereas our big brother China is at 37%. Just last week I was speaking in this Indochina global conference and we realized that if at all we want to grow, we have to consider this fact that China is our big brother, but we have our own merits. So how we can encash on our strengths and build up our road for the future that we'll have to see. Just in nutshell, if we see our total exports, they are almost 37.1 billion US dollar. And out of that, major exports are cotton textiles, oven apparels, and home textiles. This three category itself is almost 64% of the total basket of our total export earnings. Similarly, if at all we see imports, then man-made fibers, man-made staple fibers, and coated and laminated technical textiles. These are the major imports. So what this shows that all of us are aware that our strength is nothing but cotton textiles. We have to encash on that strength and how we can go ahead that we'll have to see. Now I am trying to focus on my student friends that what opportunities you have in this particular industry. Mind well, there are many jobs in the market. There are jobs in IT profession, there are jobs in many other professions where you can think of that, oh, textile technology or textile engineering is boring or I should switch over to that because it is a white collar job because all of us have to understand the basic fact that if at all we are going in the industry in a textile mill, you will be having a lot of other problems such as fly, flub, but mind well that is going to give you much more returns which I will cover later. Textile focus jobs are many. What are they? We'll just discuss about that. There are many career opportunities for you. Immediately after your graduation also you can take a career. But why to take career in textiles? Why? Because there are challenges. And whenever there is a challenge, there is a solution. So all of us have to find what is the solution. Most of the textile jobs, almost 70 to 80 percent of the jobs are technology driven. So if at all that DNA of technology, DNA of that research is there in you, you should focus on the technology driven career. Similarly, there are variations. Those who are into garments focus variations, various shades of colors. That is what if is you are liking, you should stick to textile engineering. And most importantly, out of box. Many jargons are there about the out of box thinking, this, that, but if at all you come and see and go to a textile mill, day to day there, is, there has to be out of box thinking. You are having challenges with raw material and you are having challenges where to sell, how to sell. So all those issues are there in our day to day life, if at all you are choosing a career in textiles. Now what are the roles? of a textile graduate. He can be a production engineer, he can be a planning engineer, he can be a quality person, sales person, marketing, designer, so many and so forth. Mind well, this is a very old industry and it has sustained for so long and we have a bright future. If at all we see a spinning plant, weaving plant or a processing, this is what is a conventional technical, tex conventional textiles which we can think of, then there are many job opportunities which are waiting for you and let me tell you from the, as I see this industry day in and day out, that many of the outsiders, they are jumping into our industry and capturing your jobs. Why? Because we are not giving that much importance to our own industry. Our own graduates are diversifying themselves into different area segments and that's what we have to avoid. Mind well, even if at all you are thinking of global opportunities, there are many global opportunities waiting for you in various parts of the world. Let it be fashion, let it be research, let it be manufacturing. So let's grab it. And for that we have to understand one basic fact. Maybe in three years or five years you can switch over to some other industry. But if at all you go out of the pond and you look at what's happening with the textile industry, this is what is the chart. You may start your job with three lakhs, but it ends up with almost one to two crores. This is what are the packages which are given to the textile engineers who have passed out. And these are all basic facts which I'm talking of. So bear, bear in mind that salary structure in textile mill grows exponentially and we have to focus on the ultimate goal. For that, you have to sustain in this particular industry. 
to my friends who are students, who have to see that what skill set I have. Because there are many opportunities, as I told you. You have to have passion towards something. What is that something that is known only to you? And if at all you think of that, and then you have to have your own career, choose it by having what interests me, what are the values which are there for me as well as for the job role, what type of education is required, what skill sets are required, how I can achieve my goals of my career, and ultimately, if at all you are an experienced person, then you are going to be at the top of the career. So many wide range of land of textiles within India is waiting for you. So just focus on that, conquer the world. Thank you very much. Now I request Mr. Gloy to come out with his technical presentation. Thank you. Okay. So the first thing I have to do right now is to attract your attention. Okay. You might know that you see that that's a textile factory. And you see also that's in the year 98. So one question to the technique. Ah. It's not working. Okay. Um, so I ask you in the audience, please tell me, where is this picture taken? England. England? Yeah. Indian? It's South Carolina in the US. South Carolina in the US. So that's 98. Let's continue. 2016. So again, where is this picture taken from? Germany, of course. It's uh, Germany. So you see already a difference in the, how they organize production. Yeah? You know, in Germany, very, very proud to be ordered, to have things clean and well organized. So that's the weaving will in Germany. But uh, ladies and gentlemen, of course, my research interest is how is production looking like tomorrow? Ladies and gentlemen, I feel very honored to be here. I'd like to congratulate 40 years of service. You achieved already a lot, and I wish you all the success and all the best for the upcoming years. All the best. So I'm going to talk about digitization, Industry 4.0, and sustainability. You will see major outcomes of my research projects I carry it out and some of the things that are going on in Germany regarding sustainability. I give you some insights in that. And I think afterwards we do have time for questions and answers. And I'm also here doing the afternoon until the evening. So please do not hesitate to get in contact with me if you like to ask questions. But first of all, Industry 4.0, 4.0, what's that? You probably heard of Industry 4.0. And there's a very short story about that. It's a project. It's a project defined by the German government. In 2011, well, they were thinking in the government, so what should we do in Germany? You know, we are very good in mechanical engineering. We still have a lot of industry doing production. We are good in automation. What should be the next step? And they said, okay, let's bring IT technology in our factories. You know, there's so much development going on in IT. They looked at the US, what's happening here, there with the software industry, said, okay, let's implement Industry 4.0. But of course, the question is, why is it 4.0? It could also be 3.0, or 5.0, or 6.0, or 7.0, I don't know. But there's, of course, a story behind that. And then you always see this picture explaining that Industry 4.0 is the upcoming fourth industrial revolution. And me as a mechanical textile engineer graduating from Aachen University, I'm of course happy to see a loom. So they explain the first industrial revolution took place starting in the UK, introducing steam and water power mechanization of, of machines. And then there was the second industrial revolution, start of the 20th century, and you see the famous example of Henry Ford, who produced his tea model in the US. He was walking into a butcher shop where they cut the pork into two halves and they transported to further process it, and he took this idea, 
to his cars. And then there's the third industrial revolution last century in the 70s where they used already electronics and IT in production. And then the German government claimed, okay, we will have the fourth industrial revolution based on cyber physical systems. Cyber physical system. Please tell me what is a cyber physical system. And you get already an idea if you look at this picture that, okay, there must be something with connectivity and IT and internet. But also in this case, that's very simple. There's also a clear definition for cyber physical systems. So they use real time and internet capable intelligent sensors and actuators. And some of you are just taking a picture right now with your smartphone. Think of all the sensors you've got in your smartphone. I mean, you can monitor um, the distance, you've got a capacity sensor, you can monitor velocity with your, with your sensors inside your smartphone. And just to give you a rough explanation how the development with these technologies did develop. So the first rocket going to the moon had a chip. Of course, with a memory, or oh, I don't know the capacity, but it was, if you, if you like to buy this chip with a memory nowadays, the same chip and memory that have been used for the rocket going to the moon, the price is less than half a dollar. You can get it everywhere. So there is much development. And of course, in Germany, we had a holistic view on the whole topic. You can equip your machines with CPS or the whole smart factory. You connect that to smart mobility, smart logistics, smart buildings, smart products, smart grids, internet of things, and then you can develop the whole thing. What I'm going to do, I'm going to show you an example of what's happening in textile industry. So let's start with textile production. I don't have to explain you how textile production is going on. But um, we did a survey in the German textile industry. We, we went to 100 companies, had discussions uh, with textile manufacturers, textile producers, and we tried to find out, okay, what are the topics that are of interest technology-wise for the textile industry in Germany? And you see, so of course, it's about data acquisition and processing. That's, that's clear. Industry 4.0, it's about data. The data is the value that you got by using sensors, by using transfer of data. And of course, you have to think, okay, what kind of added value can I create by the data I have in order to achieve better products, better production efficiency, and so on. Of course, you have to do data acquisition before. It's about networking and integration. So I'm going to show you just a small example on how to connect maybe textile machines. What could be a use case to have data going from one process step to the other process step? It's about service orientation, self-organization. I'm also going to talk a little bit about that, thinking of artificial intelligence that's been used in textile machines. And a very important topic in Germany is assistance systems. How can these smart systems be used in order to assist workers in a textile? But, of course, first from theory, Quickly be done, so digitization, that's also no rocket science. Here, very nice example, you have music, nice music, you take a sensor, in this case a microphone, you take an ID converter, and then you get your digital data, and this digital data can easily be saved and transferred all around the world, so that's all about that. Now looking at textile processes, and um, you will notice I did a lot with weaving machines, you will see a lot of examples on weaving machines. So having sensors in weaving machines, first example. So that's also something you, you quickly gonna recognize. That's a denim production. So um, we did install X-ray sensor between the breast beam and fabric beam in order to control fabric weight of the weaving machine. So imagine you like to have 280 gram per square meter of fabric, have that all the time constant quality control even the weft yarn is maybe changing in quality, thickness, or something like that, well, that's easy. You take a sensor, you install it to the loom, and you set up a control loom. You can do the same with, of course, air consumption. So in Germany, energy costs are a main driver for textile mills, and, and especially in a weaving mill where you have, like in Germany, you've got around 100 looms installed in a, in a weaving mill. Of course, air consumption is a big issue. And if you can monitor air consumption, of course, you can better control your processes and reduce costs. So in this case, that was a simple sensor being installed in the tubes where the air passed by. 
So pressure is about eight to 10 bar. And then we use this simple data transmitter antenna so you can easily look on your smartphone, okay, how is the air consumption of my textile? And then go further on to control the processes. And again, some theory, that's simple automation as you learn it during your mechanical engineering courses in Aachen, set up closed control loops in order to control, for example, quality and things like that. So, and of course, just to tell you, you always got a time delay in your processes. The dead time is always critical in the processes, so think about how you can get rid of your dead time. Okay, a further sensor. That's also nothing new to new. The warp tension is a cool parameter in weaving. If you take a look on the warp yarns over the width, at the edges, the warp tension is a little bit lower. In the middle, it's higher. And of course, you like to control this warp tension. So you do measurements, and then you start doing data analysis. And of course, you don't like uh, have to too high warp tension. Because in this case, if it's too high, your warp can break. If it's a staple fiber, something like that. If it's a, a technical fiber, of course, it can get somehow damaged because of the friction if you have too much stress on the yarn. On the other hand, looking at a too low value of your warp tension, the warp yarns can somehow interfere with the weft yarn and the weft yarn cannot be inserted. So having knowledge about the curves of your tension in the warp yarns can be crucial to set up the process. So you need knowledge about that. And what we did then in Aachen was of course setting up a system where we do measurements of the warp tension, go in our online optimization and simulation tools. And in this case, there were simple artificial neural networks being used in order to calculate improved setup of the weaving machine. And um, well, you can uh, adjust your back sheet of the weaving machine, and by adjusting the back sheet of your weaving machine, you adjust the tension in the yarn. So there are strong correlation. And in this case, we decided to change the position of the warp stop motion. We did analysis. You can move the warp stop motion back and forth, up and down, you can turn it. But the highest impact on warp tension was being achieved by changing the height of the warp stop motion. So we simply put an actuator to the warp stop motion to show it can change the height. Now looking back at the definition of a cyber physical system, real time internet capable sensor and actuators. So we now do have a sensor, we do have an actuator and we are able to control the machine. But is that really industry 4.0? Is that something that developed over the years? I'm not sure. So we have to look a little bit closer just to tell you why we are doing that. So again, you see here a warp yarn that's being damaged because of too high friction, too high warp tension. Then you might see these little arrows in your fabric that you don't like to have. So it's all about reducing this quality. I told you about the developments in IT. So there's much more than just having a sensor and actuator. So we were thinking of how to control fabric quality where it's being produced, exactly where the weed is forming the fabric. So uh, I show you in this case a system that we developed in Aachen and you see already it consists of the camera being installed on a loom to monitor fabric quality real time during the process in the machine. And of course, one task was, if you have ever seen a weaving machine running, it makes noise, but it's also shaking a lot. So we had to get rid of the vibrations in the system. So we designed special elements in order to have the camera in good position. And you see in this little video how it's working. So it's on a Picano loom where we installed the system. And yeah, you might see there's some backlight that's being installed. There's an animation on how it's working. So the, in this case, the camera is charging over the fabric width with a low speed, but uh, enough speed in order to monitor a certain area of the fabric that's uh, sophisticated to detect if there are errors. And then you see what's happening. In this case, it's a demonstration. My colleague is moving his pen, and in real time with new algorithms, the quality is immediately recorded. And this information can be then used in order to set up the weaving process 
or on the other hand, going with the finishing, printing, and so on to tell them information about what's going on with your fabric. So easy systems that can be developed using these IT systems, and you see again here, my colleague, he is writing something on the fabric, and it's immediately detected. Of course, it's also working when the fabric is moving and the machine is running, but in this case, my colleague cannot write something on the fabric, he would get hurt. Okay, next use case. We were looking on integration of machines. And that's a simple use case. It's really simple. So there's no rocket science about that. There's a winding process. Very sophisticated process. It's a very nice machine. Very fast. And it's highly automated. When the um, yarn breaks during the winding process, you know there's, there's an arm coming, sucking one end. There's the other arm sucking the other end, bringing the two ends of the broken yarn together and splice it together. And the machine continues running. Very nice engineered. But this little splice has a somehow different geometry and size than the rest of the yarn. So there are cases, for example, Italian garment producers who don't like to have the splice in the garment. The gentleman in the first row having a, a suit with knots inside. No, you don't like to have that. So what the Italian garment producers do, if they know there is a splice on my weft yarn being installed on the weaving machine, they go there, pull out the yarn, cut out the splice, and then the process continues. Well, now having IT technology and industry 4.0, why do they do a need to make that by hand? So we were thinking and setting up a system where the information of the localization of the splice on the spool, let's say, meter 375 could be transported to the loom. And then, of course, there are nice looms, uh, for example, from Dornier, who are capable to blow out the weft yarn without having it inserted. So they are, and the weft yarn is gone, and then the next one comes, and this one is going to be inserted. So it should be possible to have the information of the localization of the splice being transferred to the loom, and the loom then can react to this quality, and then you integrate two processes. And simple as that, we used a spool, we used a spool, we integrated an RFID tag, we used an RFID antenna, and you know these modern machines, if you look at the thing where the electronics are, you can open the box, there's an ethernet interface, you can plug in your computer, and then you can communicate with the machine. You still need some programmable know-how and some codes by the machine producer in order to set up web density, but that's all available, and you can set up such a system. Um, of course, there is no data on this RFID transponder. It's just a number, but the number is correlated to a database where the informations are recorded. So easy thing like that, and you have processes that are talking to each other. Okay, next step. Now there's, you see already, talking about assistance systems in the weaving process. So the examples are always weaving, but you can imagine transfer that to different textile machines. And the situation in Germany is somehow special. So in Germany, there are around 100,000 people working in the textile industry. So it's not much compared to India, 100,000. And uh, we do have a demographic change in Germany. So the society is getting older and older. And you cannot change that. The government cannot say, okay, no, we like to have more kids, and bam, there are more kids, and then there are more workers. That's not possible. So uh, we were thinking of, okay, what to do? Because the textile mills in Germany, they got a problem to attract people, to get skilled people to work in Germany. And then they were thinking, okay, can we not use assistance systems in order to support untrained worker in how to manage a textile machine? And also in this use case, you see already what's happening. So this colleague, he got glasses, and he was asked to set up a weaving machine where the weft yarn was broken. So we place the weft yarn on a weaving machine, and in this simple use case, you're going to now see a video what's happening when he's looking through his glasses on the weaving machine. So you see, okay, that's again our Picanol weaving machine. We put a, a QR code on the creel, so the creel is recognizing, the system is recognizing where it is. And then we guide the user by giving questions and some animations through the process of replacing a weft yarn. So in this simple case, he was asked to replace the bobbin, and then you see, okay, please put the weft yarn through the break. 
Yeah, be aware here. Maybe you could change the color. Blue is not so visible, but that's depending on what the customer likes to have. Go to the pre-winder. Okay, you have to press here to insert the yarn here into the pre-winder and so on and so on. So the user is guided through a process in order to set up the yarn. That's also simple, but there's, we, we came out with some major findings during our, our research. So what's very important for these systems, that's what we call um, the acceptance. So in order to get the requirements for such a system and to get high acceptance by the users and users of such systems, you have to interact very soon already in the phase of getting the requirements with the end user. You have to ask him, okay, where do you have problems at the machine? Where do you need assistance? Then you have to start your design process, come up with the first prototype, go again to the end user, ask him, okay, please work at it, it is good. Now, okay, we, into, we make it better. And with this approach, what we call this um, acceptance-oriented end user approach, you can get high acceptance of your systems. And that's, that's really important. And we also looked on, okay, what's happening, what's happening if we use these systems in order to get people trained? And of course, we noticed that IT knowledge is going to be more needed in the future. So out of this project, we also gave advice to the German government on how to educate people using these systems. Let's continue a little bit getting more into practice and also what's happening in transfer. So I'll just show you some examples of projects we carried out with Adidas. So as one example, uh, that was an app by Adidas. So I could have taken a picture and you see there was a rendering of a shoe. The picture was put on the shoe and you could order the shoe, 110 euros. Six weeks afterwards, it would be delivered. So I already started to make pictures of my colleagues to have them on my shoe. But um, Adidas stopped the project. You cannot download this app anymore. You have an idea why. Copyright, copyright yeah, copyright. Well, of course, from a technology point of view, that's simple to understand. You take a digital printer, you've got your individualized, mass-customized shoe, and that's fine. But copyright is an issue. So Adidas, of course, didn't want someone taking a picture from a Nike logo and put it on an Adidas shoe. They didn't want to have, you know, like political things on their shoes. They didn't like to have different brands on the shoes. So they had to control each picture that was have been taken. And they said, that's a little bit demanding. Still today, controlling every picture someone is taking, that's demanding. The other fact is, what's happening if the shoe doesn't fit you? You order this shoe, six weeks after one it's been delivered, you try on, it's too small. You're going to send it back and they, no. So that didn't work. So we were in negotiation and thinking with Adidas, okay, what can we do to get production closer to the customer? And Adidas is producing 350 million pair of shoes every year. 350 million pair of shoes, mainly in China, in A East Asia, and um, every model comes in seven different sizes and ten different color variations, but how can we get production closer to the customer? And um, there was uh, one project you might have heard of, the project called Speed Factory. So that was in the design phase of our project with Adidas. We were thinking, okay, how can we use robot technology, digitalization, industry 4.0 to have shoe production back in Germany? One important thing, also it's industry 4.0. Adidas always got three stripes. Please don't put four stripes on an Adidas shoe. So, and we not just did the simulation, but Adidas also opened a shoe factory in Germany, nearby Ansbach in Nuremberg. So that's, that's the video of the so-called speed factory that was realized in Germany, where they produced half a million pair of shoes in Germany. There was a second speed factory, in the US, nearby Atlanta. So you see uh, some insights. Of course, you don't see everything. The most interesting parts are somehow covered. But you see that's how they make the soul. You see, still see people working in, in this factory. You see robots. You will see a knitting machine, some cutting processes and joining processes. But I mean, you see a flatbed knitting machine and so on and so on. And Adidas produced shoes in Germany. I said they produced because two months ago, 
Adidas decided to put the whole factory to China. So. Well, I talked to Adidas. Um, there are certain reasons why they do that. There is also change in strategy and so on and so on. But, you know, me as a researcher, are we now really close to the customer? I mean, being close to the customer, that's, of course, very important. So uh, we were sitting together with the, with the guys um, in research from Adidas um, doing, uh, after the first year of this project and said, okay, why don't we look how we get closer to the customer? And what I'm going to show you now, that then the second project, um, we carried out with Adidas, a so-called store factory. So first you had speed, now you have the store factory, and that was the outcome of our research project that was in the middle of Berlin, Berlin, at the most expensive shopping street, we put a store. We, together with Adidas, we put up a store, and you see already it's about sweater. And what you're gonna see in the video right now, it's how we interact with the customer and how we did in-store production of our product. So in the first step, the customer was guided into a room where a beamer put an animation on the body of the customer and by movement of the customer, he changed the design. Then the customer was guided to the next room where we put a laser scanner, he got scanned. So we got the size. He was guided to a working station where he can change the color, look at the design, said, okay, I'm fine. And then the sweater was immediately produced. So let's take a look on the process. The customer is entering the store. Yeah, this salesperson guided into a room where by movement, the design is changed. We put the laser scanner where we did the measurement of the size. Then there was a working station where the end user could choose the color, print, and then you see we put four, four blood, uh, knitting machines into the store. So there was also a sewing operation, washing operation, thermofixation, and in 175 minutes, this lot size one individualized sweater has been produced, 100% merino wool, we sold it for 200 euros. So that was then, thank you. That was then going closer to the customer. But I, I must admit, of course, there were some tricks besides that. So there were just four colors that could be uh, chosen. Because, of course, you had to have the yarn in inventory for these colors. And the colors changed every month. And also with, with this, the problem was, of course, having the design, the size of the customer, and putting all this data in a correct way into the knitting machine so that the sweater is designed, knitted in the right way. So, of course, we had a strong interaction with all these uh, mechanical uh, people at Adidas in our university, but it worked out. And, well, Adidas, they said it was a very good project, but it was the most expensive shopping suite in Germany. So they said, just selling one product in the most expensive place in Germany, hmm, that could be difficult, yeah, you know. So, but as a research project, of course, we were happy. So uh, let's continue a little bit. Uh, what's happening else in Aachen? You, have, you probably heard of the Digital Capability Center. So there's a whole production line set up for narrow weaving production. And all these things that I showed you, digital assistance system, sensors, uh, condition monitoring, and so on, are installed on this process chain. And this capability center is just set up to train people to train people getting along with all these technologies, to have workshops to come up with own ideas how to do digital production of textiles in the future. And to just show you another example on what's happening all over the world. So there's, um, in Turkey, um, there's company, the German company Hugo Boss, who are producing also suits and garments. And you see already what's happening here. So they use a digital assistance system and dashboards in order to have uh, KPIs being uh, communicated to the workers, giving them assistance. But they also looked in uh, robot technology for the sewing process. So how can that be done? And I just talked to the guys uh, last week in Izmir. And they said, OK, Mr. Gloy, we've got good experience with the assistance system. That's working fine. We were looking at 100% automation solution. That didn't work. So the 50, 60% automation solution, it's working better. Because the textile still 
Every product is different. Every material is different. You need new uh, grapier technology every time you change a product and so on and so on. So they said by their experience, a 50-60% automation solution is much more better. Okay, what else is happening? So there's a project called FutureTex in, in Germany. It's taking place in Chemnitz, where I'm also doing research. And it's again on the fourth industrial revolution. And just to give you a quick insight, you see already the approach is similar. The approach is similar. You look on the customer having designing the, the product, then you've got the planning and control of production and all these additional services for smart maintenance, service platforms, calculation of machine setup, and then you go into the process chain from a weaving machine uh, to pretreatment of your fabrics, additive manufacturing, digital printing, and then uh, cutting and sewing operations done automatically. So also in this case, of course, we equip all the systems with sensors and to see, okay, what additional data do we can get and using then big data approaches to have smart maintenance, better setup of the machines and better calculation of needed settings for the machine. So, and just to show you, of course, what is also being investigated in this case are additive manufacturing strategies. So if you think of workwear, where you like to have protection of the elbow immediately integrated in, in the fabric. So that might be a technology additive manufacturing where you can integrate these things. Or of course, uh, digital printing, that's also of interest if you look at individualized uh, production. So digital printing is something that you, of course, need to investigate if you like to come up with uh, these ideas. And also, again, robots being used for sewing operation, and, of course, also our topic, especially in Germany, are automated guided vehicles that's being used in order to transport spools to the machines and so on and so on. So uh, that's, that's somehow what's being investigated. But uh, this is not new. So there were also in Germany in the late 80s textile mills using this technology. But something changed to nowadays there was no internet no network that could have been done in order to do all the location and things for these, for these machines. Coming to more important topics also in this case, it's of course about the economics. So if you like to do all these things that I have shown, you have to take, of course, very good calculation of what's my return on investment. Does it make sense? Just to do it because you can do it? Mm -hmm. You have to take a look and do your calculations. For example, in this case, we were looking, okay, how many spools are there? What is the rejection that we could achieve? And what's our payback period? And of course, based on these figures, you can better decide what technology could make sense. Does it really make sense to make industry 4.0 to get the data or does it make not sense? These figures have to be right, of course, also. And in an outlook, and an outlook that's something uh, we are also working on is, of course, having the whole textile production chain going from supplier, spinning, fabric production, customer to end customer. And you've got your, your operational level in your, in your uh, production facility, executive level, and the process level, and then looking on a communication platform where you can exchange the relevant data all over the textile process chain, also with your suppliers and end customers. And that leads to... I would say the last slide on the digitization, so the digital factory, if you have a really holistic view on that, please keep in mind, of course, you've got your organization, so digital business models, use cases, and the supply chain. You have to look at the workforce, work and qualification, and of course, at technology, production processes, and digital product design, there are also, also a lot of things that are being developed. Okay, why to do that? Why should you do look into industry 4.0 and digitization. So it's increase of production efficiency. For example, reduce startup time, less energy, better quality, or maybe less stuff. You need to look at novel products and services. You can design maybe smarter products or with products with higher added value. And of course, very important, these are these novel business models. And I just gonna show you something that's important regarding these novel business models and some use cases, companies, garment companies in Germany who came up with new business models in order to um, attract customer. So what you see is of course a change in the customer behavior. So if you look in history, 
First, you had small shops where textiles have been sold. Then you had, especially in Germany, shopping centers, the discounters, how we call them, online, and then you go to mobile. So, of course, an uh, entrepreneur, he got challenges yesterday and today. Are there alternatives to look at all these developments? Who is really driving uh, the digitization and Industry 4.0? And there might be the risk, especially for garment producers in Germany, that they do lose whole turnover or even the whole business. So that's a really crucial situation for garment producers in Germany. And of course, what's important, it's not about the sales. You have to put your customer in the center. So always look at your customer. What, what's, what's he see driving? And of course, you sell a solution, not a product. But I'm going to give you some examples for that. And something that's, of course, also clear, that's what we call the innovation supplier dilemma. So you've got your textile production chain, very nice, you make money. But there is someone who's acting with the end user, the consumer, who's making more money. So you have to think, what's, what's your strategy? How do you overcome this, this solution? And probably the traditional business models will not work. And that's a famous example from Germany. MP3, you all know MP3. It was developed in Germany. A Fraunhofer Institute in Germany developed MP3. Who made the money? Apple. They came with a better business model. They were customer driven. They designed the nicer MP3 player. They had a shop iTunes where people can buy MP3. And they made the money with that. So always think how to get value, how to interact with your customer. And of course, there are methods in order to design business model innovation. And they're simple, I mean, methods where you look, okay, after brainstorming phase, what could be a business model innovation? Look at who are the key partners, activities, resources. What's your value proposition? What kind of value do you propose to your customer? And how can you can validate that? Of course, look, what are the channels on where to sell your product? And thinking of the exchange or the change in the customer behavior, there might be new channels to address, cost structure, and of course, important, what's your revenue stream? How you make money? And also in this case, there are new ways on how to make money. And I'll just give you an example from a German uh, weaving mill, German weaving mill, Schmitzwerke. Schmitzwerke, they're in the, uh, let's say, north of Germany, um, family owned, so Mr. Schmitz is running the business, um, and they do sell a solution. So they make uh, sunscreens, protection against sun. That's the solution. But they also offer the service. So what they do, if you like to buy sunscreen, sun protection, a worker from Schmitzwerke is coming to your house. He's taking the measurements of your house, the windows. He, they go back in the factory. They, if you like certain colors or prints, they produce the fabric. They produce the steel frame. They come back to your house and install the whole system. So that's service. And of course, they've got the product. And they've done that by having also different brands. So marketing is also important. And Marky Lux, it's one of the favorite brands to do so. And they now start also looking at home textiles, or Yoyo, a startup where, they say, where you have, again, interaction with your customer. The customer can design home textiles, pillows in the internet, and then have them being produced and delivered. Another example, just one example. Suit supply. Uh, the company is nearly 20 years old and got a turnover of 400 million euros. Young company with a high turnover. Production is done internal. So what was the business model behind this company? Of course, the design is driven by the customer, but in order to buy, you have to become a member in a club. So how do you attract people? How do you do marketing? Think of how can you interact with your customer. In this case, this turned out to be a very, very good way on to approaching your customer in a successful way. So please always keep in mind, also when you do in engineering, mechanical engineering, automation, uh, your developments, don't keep, uh, don't lose an eye on your customer. So um, I continue with the next topic. And I'm just gonna give you some insights about uh, sustainability in Germany. So uh, what's happening there? Um, 
we do have a problem with textile waste in Germany. China is not accepting our textile waste anymore. And we've got a lot of used textiles and uh, unused textiles that's being collected and then now uh, laying around in the harbors and companies are asking also the research and associations what should we do with the waste. And there is something happening. So already in 2017, the EU decided on the circular economy package. So there need to be higher recycling rates. Landfill will be banned. And there has to be a separate collection from used textiles by 2025. So there are going to be even more textile waste in Germany. What do we do with that? As now we don't have a clear answer. So you know that's the cycle that you can go. Well, that's fine. But still, so for the used textiles, they are collected. Some of them are being resold in Germany. Some is sent to different countries. Some of that is processed. A lot of it is burned or going in landfill. That's all going to be forbidden. So maybe you know a little bit of waste collection in Germany. And I talked yesterday to someone during the dinner and said, OK, I'm going to show you how it's looking like in Germany. So. That's, you see, that's a street, so at one day they come and collect all the garbage. And we've got four boxes. That's regular waste, organic waste, paper, and plastics. And we don't know what's happening. Are there going to be a fifth box for textiles in Germany? We are not sure what's happening. But we know that, and that's what I'm going to show you right now, that's how we, how we do it, it in Germany. So you've got used textiles, they are collected, transported, and packed, and sorted. You've got ball pressing, they are again transported to feeding union cut and tiered. You've got ball pressing and then you've got tear fibers. But of course, from fiber quality, these fibers are not as good as the orange fibers. So what they produce in general are non-wovens for isolation. And just to give you a short view, so that's how they collect textile waste in Germany. These boxes are standing around, they're not at the wholesales. And then they do the sorting of the textiles. So there are companies in Germany do a sorting of textiles depending on the quality and material, um, the, um, also the color. And then you see in this little view, video here, yeah, they have to collect it. There are also developments where we look at uh, sensors being integrated in order to have uh, the sorting being optimized. But hmm. And then, okay, I don't have to explain you, you've got the cutting machine. But again, from a mechanical engineering point of view, this cutting machine to cut the garments don't make the knife moving like this, because then your time in contact with the textile is too long. You have too much friction. It's getting too hot. It's like a movement like this of the knife, of course. You've got the tearing process, yeah, where you then later on tear the fibers. And in general, you've got six of these tearing one being in line. But there are still problems, a lot of problems. What's happening with plants, multi-layer textiles, coated textiles, construction products, additives and treatments. And so for these kind of textiles, we are looking for solutions. There are, there are first things coming to the market. So for example, Eastman, they say they can do depolymerization, going from PET back to DMT and EG. We don't know how that's working. There are things that have been developed in Aachen, so I'm slowly coming to my end. So that's a carpet, typical carpet. Nice carpet like here. And as you know, there are a lot of products being used in a carpet. So you've got the pile yarn, the primary backing, secondary backing, pre-coat. How do you recycle that? Of course, it's better to have a monomaterial stream to recycle that. So there are things that we developed, of course, where we look on, OK, that's, that's a sample of a carpet we developed together with company Interface in the Netherlands on how to have separation technologies for these multi-layer textiles. And you see nothing is happening. Nothing is happening. The carpet is going to be cooked. But after a certain while, OK, you can have separation. In this case, we just introduced a separation layer where you've got bubbles filled with gas, and these gas expand, and then you can have separation. So, but these technologies are not in place. So we are looking on how to transfer that. Of course, we are looking on what, how can we get companies together. So there are things like the sustainable textiles tool, 
taking place in Germany. And of course, sustainable is something where the fashion industry says, okay, that must be the key driver. So there are projects right now in Germany starting to establish recycling centers for textiles. Within the next five years, we are thinking of having two to three recycling centers for textiles in order to come up with solutions for that. As I heard, sustainability and recycled products is also a major driver for the textile industry in India. So I'm happy to see if there might be good collaborations in order to go further with these topics. And that's all for now. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Thank you very much Mr. Gloy, for excellent and in-depth presentation. Now this is a time for question and answer with Mr. Gloy. My first question to you, we have a lot of people. Yeah. 4.0 also suggests that you may reduce certain people as per your slides. Yeah. So how to take care of it from the Indian perspective? Well, um, what I think what's really important and what's a good approach is if you, if you look on how to train people. How to train people. You can use these digital technologies to train people. And it's not about, you know, then uh, replacing people but give assistance. So that's, that's also in, in Germany a major issue. Of course, if we come up with technologies, the German government asks us to produce workplace and not to get rid of workplace. So you have to really take care, sensitive about where to use automation. Um, in some cases, we see that there might be jobs who are really, I would say, taking place in dangerous environment, who are not good for the health, also in the textile industry, where we say, okay, automation replacing of job could be useful. We see that simply that, for example, qualified weavers are not uh, available in Germany. When Adidas came up with a project on knitting, they could not find knitters. They found knitters, but then the old traditional knitting companies were mad because all the knitters were attracted from them. So there is there's something where you have to look at, but again, I think giving people assistance and to make the, their job better, that's the most important thing. Okay, thank you. Questions, please? Just raise your hand. Good morning. Uh, I'm asking one question. You talk about the used fabrics, used dresses, used garments. But I heard some news or I read some books where the outdated fashion, like today's fashion outdated tomorrow or day after tomorrow, and they put fire, they burn it, the, all these garments. So what is that solution? We're going to do it in future. So you ask what to do to not burn the, uh, the garments. Yes. So to be honest, um, also in Germany, garments are being burned. The companies, they don't talk a lot of that, but they don't like to have their, their garments being reintroduced to the market on a lower price. So they are very curious about that. And as I said, one thing that we like to look at, how you can retract fibers again from the garments and then go into products into how you can have maybe spinning for uh, upscaling of these fibers and so on and so on. We do have to come up with a solution because it's going to simply be forbidden. You are not allowed to burn textiles anymore in the future, so there must be solutions for that. Okay, but maybe uh, recycling became, became expensive, and that's why maybe they prefer to put it on fire. No, no, that's not advisable to do. Recycling has to be done. And in fact, now brands, they are demanding for recycled fibers. Yeah. So if at all that recycled fiber logo is there, you get premium on the, your no, products. I'm talking about the uh, outdated fashions one. They, why they are they not doing the recycling? They are doing that's what he has shown in his presentation. You can be recycled. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. So yeah. It, doesn't, it can be new or outdated fashion, doesn't matter. Uh, you have to, again, go on the fiber level and then in product. What, of course, one idea is to look at technical products. Okay. Okay, but that's, it's, you've got blends, you've got mixtures, you've got polyester and cotton, how to handle that. So there are still some questions not being answered. That's okay. simply the fact. Okay. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Dr. Raina, please. Uh, the textile engineer in India, or for that matter, at least from our city, uh, they are students who understand the textile material, they understand the textile processes. What do these students need to enable themselves with in order to be able to cater to this future of textile industry, future of digitization? What should they be learning? Where should we, they, they be spending their time apart from in addition to the textiles? Oh, that's a very good question. Thank you. So 
Well, of course, having a strong fundament in textile technology know-how, that's always good if you work in this industry. So if you do that, that's very good. If you like to go additional for these things that I showed you, and of course, taking a look maybe on IT knowledge. You, I mean, you don't need to be the one who's programming the app later on, but has a basic understanding on how it's programming be done, what's the server technology, how do I transfer data, which kind of data formats are there, also looking on what's the control loop, how do I exchange data between machines, what is the field bus, what is the sensor, what kind of sensors are there. So having knowledge of these things could be very useful. But in this case, I would advise not going into deep, having an overview, having a good overview on how automation technology is working will help you very much in your future because then you can better interact with the persons who are designing these systems, you better understand their requirements and you can give better requirements also to the one who's working with. Thank you. Mr. Farooq Hassan, please. Uh, there are a lot of uh, research you are doing and development which you're doing. Ultimately, uh, we have to invest a lot of money for take forward on this. The issue we are, what we are talking about that in last five years, in April, there is a no growth in globally mm -hmm. and it is getting very difficult mm -hmm for the country like India, Bangladesh, China, yep. they are not, it's uh, uh, so a lot of investment and ultimately the uh, price is getting cheaper and cheaper and it is not sustainable. So yep. in one way, uh, the developed country, the consumers are looking for a new fashion, new design and environment friendly. Yep. And, uh, but sitting in Paris or sitting in uh, Frankfurt, the designer, the girl doesn't know how to produce this garment. Yep. So, she is selecting the darkest color, the brightest color, yeah. where you need a lot of consumption of electricity, yeah. gas, yeah. and yeah. dyes, yeah. and chemicals. Yeah. Yeah. And then everybody is talking that environment friendly, environment yeah. friendly, yeah. but they're, they're, the consumer is not ready to pay this. What is going to happen in future? Because there's a more design, recycle, this is very easy yeah. to say, to, uh, uh, to uh, research, yeah. but production, finally, production is going to push in this Asia side. Yeah. And uh, and then the pressure will come because who do the design and who do the uh, purchasing is completely different team. Yep. The, the, uh, the marketing team, the sourcing team, they said that we don't understand, so we want these prices. Yep. So uh, I'm sure what I'm trying to say you understand, right? Yeah, well, you, of course, you mentioned a lot of very important points. And just to tell you maybe from a German perspective, so uh, the German government is also pushing the brands and the designers to have knowledge about the textile process chain and looking at sustainability. So having a designer who doesn't know about that, so they have to be certificates in order for the products. But there is, there is one big topic that we discuss in Germany, that's fast fashion. You know, you've got like 12 new uh, rounds of design every year. And um, well, I don't know the solution to that right now, but I know that there are ongoing discussions in Germany would it not be better to buy garments with higher quality where we pay a higher price than buying a lot of textiles with lower quality at a lower price? That is a discussion that's ongoing. And um, just to give you again the example from Adidas. I mean, we sold a sweater for 200 euros. Adidas is selling tools for shoes for 200 euros, but they're also shang, uh, selling shoes for 30 euros. So in Germany, we say at the end, it's the customer who's deciding. And it's, it's a very... It's a difficult situation, I must admit. Yeah, that's, that's the way it is. Yes, please. My question or my concern is that uh, uh, textile uh, industry is a very attractive industry, both for, from a government perspective and from an industry, because it is job intensive, mm -hmm. provides job, mm -hmm. so economically it's good. Mm -hmm. Also in terms of skills, uh, it is not high hand in terms of skills, especially for garment making. But during your presentation, you gave a good insight on why uh, textile industry should look at uh, the future, embrace digitali digitalization. Thank you. Thank you. So would you advise new textile industry, especially in the context of uh, developing countries such as Rwanda, to go into that direction? Or to what extent would you advise us to go? Thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you for your question. Well, I just simply answer as a mechanical engineer. As a mechanical engineer being taught in Aachen, you always look on to be the most efficient. 
And if you find a technology maybe that could reduce the waste in your process and it's economical feasible, so why don't you do it? So, but it's, of course you have to take its use case based. You have to look, does it make sense? Now, is, is it economical feasible? Is the technology available? Can I implement it? There are a lot of facts that have to be taken into account to make such a decision. But to take a look at it and to, to see, to do a validation of it, of course I would recommend that, do that. Yes, of course. Yeah, in fact, uh, for Rwanda or any of the African countries, if you see that your operating cost is at it much more attractive than instead of importing it at three or four times that of the sales uh, price in the euro, it is better to have your own industry, which would be textile industry. We are already, both of us are working in those countries. So you can get a good solution. By the way, now last question from the student, please. Yeah, yeah I, I, I've got one question. I just wanted to know whether your institute and other have they worked anything on textile artificial intelligence? Uh, uh, for uh, textile artificial intelligence, so we use artificial intelligence in our processes. So neural network, fuzzy logic, genetic algorithm, these are, I mean, all the discussion about artificial intelligence, that's, that's nothing new. These, tech, these algorithms, technology are available since 30, 40 years. So now there's a lot of rumor marketing about it, but we use that in order to calculate optimized machine setting. Thank you very much, Mr. Gloy. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Gloy. Uh, it really was uh, a very, very interesting uh, uh, presentation. I am not a technical person. Um, I just conduct programs <laughs> for textiles. Uh, despite that, I enjoyed your presentation and I could uh, understand also a few things. So I think you are a very good speaker and a teacher. Thank you so much for, <laughs> yeah, without learning A, I understood Z. But, uh, so thank you very much for that uh, personally and on behalf of all the students here as well. Um, uh, we would, uh, the next uh, main session is uh, the uh, history of Indian Postal Service by Ms. Swati Pandey, uh, Postmaster General. Uh, she could not join us this morning. She's here now. And we would formally invite her to uh, give her presentation after two, three minutes. But I would request all the audience to give her a warm welcome applause. I also extend a warm welcome to Ms. Arora, who's uh, accompanied her. Uh, thank you so much for taking your time and joining us, as well as the other officials from the Postal Department who has come to join this program and meet with all of us. Uh, I extend a very warm welcome to all of you. Um, as mentioned this morning, uh, may I invite uh, Professor Josfar from Moi University. Uh, he is here in India to connect with Indian universities and uh, also introduce his uh, work and the institute back in Kenya. Good morning. My name is Josphat Igadwa Mwasiagi. Um, okay. It's called technology. Yeah. So, as I was saying, uh, everywhere people ask me, when did you first come to India? When I tell them 1987, they look like, no, no, you're not telling the truth. And I look at them and I wonder, why should I not tell the truth? Okay, for those who don't know, I did my bachelor degree in PSG Tech, Coimbato. So I'm a graduate of the... Uh, 91 batch. So I'm not new to India. I came to Mumbai, which when we, when it was being called Bombay in 1987, passed all the way up to Coimbatore, stayed there for four years, went back to Kenya. I now work at Moore University as an associate professor, thanks to the good training that I got in PSG Tech. 
which encompass a lot of work, hands-on, all the way in Ahmedabad, Baroda. Yes, so I have a lot of training in India. I've also worked in the industry, thicker cloth mills, run by some uh, Bendy, uh, I mean, um, uh, Mahindra company, uh, who is also Indian. I worked there for three years, and then I went on to Rivertex, where I worked as a spinning manager. Rivertex was built by the Germans, so I have a lot of experience here and there. Mo University, where I worked since 1996, is a public university. For those who know a bit of Kenya, Moi was the second president of Kenya, and Moi University was the second public university in Kenya. I'm in the School of Engineering. Just a, a brief history. Kenya is a small country, 47 million people, about a sixth of India. So quite a very small country. Currently, we have 31 public universities, but Moi, Moi University was launched in 1984 as the second public university. Many of you may know about Kenya. I don't have to talk much about it, but if you want marathon, it is in that part of the Africa, Kenya and Ethiopia. That's where all the marathon starts and ends. <laughs> Recently, one of the Kenyans made history by being the first man to run be below 200 I mean, two hours uh, for 40, I, I mean, for, for two kilometers. That is Eldud uh, that was running. And also, there's been a lot of things on marathon. But maybe I'm saying this because Mo University is the city of champions. That's where all the winners of marathon come from. They don't come from everywhere in Kenya. No, they only come from that region. If you don't believe me, for those who are from Kenya, Kipchoge, Kipsaina, those are names from a particular area in Kenya. So what happens to them, I don't know. I'm not from that area. I'm only working there. So I'm not a marathon runner. Sorry. Okay, more university. We have got 15 schools uh, spanning all the way. It is a public university. Being the second one, it has nearly everything. So there is medicine, there is science, there is engineering, there is education, everything is there. We have directorates, nine of them. We have institutes, two of them. We have campuses, four of them. We have students, about 52,000. We have staff, about 10,000. Out of these, 3,000 are teaching staff. We have one referral hospital, and this is very interesting. We have a textile factory. Mo University is the only public university in Kenya that owns a textile factory. So there's a lot of history that goes there with textile. Uh, just for your information, how is this one used? The man over there, this way, in Kenya, I'm supposed to refer to him as His Excellency. That's the president of Kenya. The man towards this is His Excellency, the president of Kenya. This is last year. And the one behind him is his deputy. This is in Rivertex, factory owned by Mo University. When they were, I mean, when they were relaunching the factory after getting a loan from Indian government. <laughs> so there's a lot of connection that Mo University has with the Indian government, and the machines came from, most of the machines came from Lakshmi Machine Works. Okay. So I want to go quickly into the School of Engineering. We have seven departments. So one of them is mechanical, then we have energy, we have civil, electrical, then I come from the Department of Manufacturing, Industrial, and Textile Engineering. For your information, textile has been uh, taken by the government of Kenya to be one of the uh, factory, I mean, one of the sectors that is supposed to spur industrial growth. So they are putting in a lot of money in the factory, in the training, so on and so forth. Uh, we have undergraduate programs in the School of, I mean, in, in, in the school of Engineering. Our, uh, our programs are five years. Then we have uh, master, I mean, master and, and, and PhD degrees. In the school, we have 1,200 students. Maybe I should say one of the students is, I mean, was my daughter, who was in, who was in Gurgaon about five weeks ago, being trained on high grade. She's an electrical engineer from Moi University. So Mo, Kenya and Moi, I think they are about the same. We have a lot in common. These are our, um, I mean, some of our equipment. 
we have this is a chemical lab, then this is the textile lab, then this is the chemical lab, this is the mechanical, this, this is used by all the students, uh, first year and second year. They have to learn the basics, uh, how to do the basics, silate and those, and I mean, I mean, and so on. Then, in, in my department, we have the undergraduate degree, five years. We have the postgraduate degree, I mean, postgraduate degrees, whereby we have masters and, and, and PhD. Uh, we have students who are local and international. International, of course, they are all from Africa. We have students from Uganda. We have students from, from Zimbabwe. We have students from Tanzania. They are mostly from Africa. Then our staff is really a mixed grill. We have uh, one full professor who was trained in Pakistan and in Belgium. Then we have associate professors, I'm one of them. I'm trained in India and China. We have one that was trained in Kenya and in Russia. Then uh, we have senior lecturers. We have lecturers. Our staff around, I mean, all our staff are PhD holders, which is quite a very good situation in Kenya, because this is very rare. Most of the African universities, they have one PhD holder and a lot of undergraduates. Then we have um, the Rivertex, as I've mentioned to you. Uh, the looms are from Susa, but uh, the, the spinning machines are from Lakshmi Machine Works. By the way, when I was in India, I was the best uh, spinning student. I got the Prestex Award in 1988, if you go check your history. So, I advise, the uh, I advise the government because uh, I, I, I'm, I'm used to Lakshmi machine. I told them they buy all the spinning machines from Lakshmi. So they're all coming from there. I'm not a weaver, so they went to Germany for the weaving machines. Maybe you should have taught me more about weaving. I will have told them the same. Okay, the undergraduate degree. We changed it. It was Bachelor of Textile. We changed it to uh, bachelor, of, I mean, bachelor of Engineering, Industry, and Textile. Uh, the program began in 1991, and it was later modified. So we, we have, currently we have 150 students, quite a small department, compared to India, of course, and we have graduated over 100 students. That's a bit of our lab. I think those are a bit of our labs. Um, then the postgraduates, we have Master of Science in Industrial Engineering, and Master of Science in Textile Engineering. We have local and international students. We have... PhD program in materials and textile engineering. We have PhD in industrial engineering. We also have local and international students. Projects. We have several projects. One of them that, I, that is, is ending this year, we had uh, 2.3 million from, from EU, where I was coordinating to train uh, engineers in Africa. So out of this, we were able to train uh, engineers in textile engineering in Kenya. Uh, we also have many other projects. And um, there are quite very many. I'll not go into, into all of them. Uh, like, the, like Rivertex, we are getting money from the Indian government through the Kenyan government. Collaborations we have in Europe, in America, in Asia. We have collaboration with Ghent University, Purdue University, Donghua University, where I did my master's and PhD. And I was able to negotiate for that MOU. Uh, we have in Africa, Nelson Mandela, Metropolitan University, Val University, so on and so forth. Uh, recently, we came up with issues, and uh, I came up with a one-week course supported by uh, ITC, International Trade Center, and we were able to train hand weavers, so we are now saying the university has to go to the people. We've been waiting for them to come to us now. We think we are changing the course. So for that, we've gone. We are teaching natural dyes. So we make them to know how to use natural dyes. This is also environmental friendly, and it is sustainable. So here we were able to train people. These are students that are being trained, and also these are uh, 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 they are students, and also they are people from the industry. So we trained people on how to use natural dyes, and we produce a lot of beautiful sheds, as you can see. All these are our trainings we did in Moi University. We also did in another town called Kitale, and also another town called Kisumu, or Ahero. Uh, we were able to play around with modern and different natural dyes to produce different sheds. Uh, Africans like a lot of colors just like the Asians, just like the Indians, so we think we can make a lot of colors, um, and I think that is where we can have a lot of collaboration, designs, patterns, so on and so forth, and something that is coming up, maybe we need to look into the intellectual property. 
I know ITC is represented here. It is something that we are trying to look into so that the hand weavers are not shortchanged because we think they may have something that is a little bit local that can be modified to take over the, I mean, to, to, to go to the, to, the, to the global stage. And as they do that, they need to be protected. Uh, we've done a lot of thesis, both in spinning, in um, fibers like bananas, uh, natural dyes, 3D printing. We have a lot of publications all over. We publish in all, nearly all the journals. Uh, and I think that's what I want to say for now. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Josepha. Coimbatore definitely is a major textile center in India. Um, and these days, I must say that Coimbatore is dominating India ITME society and the textile engineering industry. Uh, we have our chairman from Coimbatore. We have our chief justice from um, Chief Justice of India from Coimbatore and our chief guest of the day uh, from Coimbatore. And I thought that I'm balancing the act by inviting someone from Kenya. <laughs> and he landed up in Coimbatore and then it's Coimbatore in Kenya and Kenya in Coimbatore. But I'm a proud Indian about that. So. Thank you so much for joining this uh, session here with us. And I hope uh, you continue to have more regions from India in Kenya, not just Coimbatore. May I uh, request the chairman of India ITME Society, Mr. Hari Shankar, to extend a warm and cordial welcome to our next speaker and special guest, Ms. Swati Pandey, Postmaster General, Mumbai Region, Government of India. Ms. Swati Pandey is an Indian Postal Service Officer of 1997 batch. Presently, she is the Postmaster General of Mumbai Region, having the administrative control of 220 post offices in Mumbai. She is a Master of Science from University of Pune, MBA in Rural Marketing, having proficiency in administration and broad-based interface communication with both government and corporate agencies. You may wonder that what is the connect with textiles. As you can see, we have a lot of heritage stamps based on the textile history of our country. And she's also going to introduce some more to us and also take us through our history. Um, for the seniors here, the post must be holding a lot of sweet memories, fond memories, proud memories. We used to receive results and I don't know what not through post which is gone digital these days, sir, because <laughs> digitalization is the theme of the day. So, uh, Chairman, welcome to Ms. Swati Pandey. May I also uh, extend a warm welcome to Ms. Arora. Thank you, sir, Chairman. Ma'am, stage is yours. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I have met a few people yesterday evening and uh, actually I feel what am I doing here you know because uh, you are people from the uh, textile industry um, missionary everything textiles I like everything textiles because it is uh, an inherent in, you know part of Indian culture so I think to spin a tale uh, in which uh, we should be proficient at because when you are uh, administering about five and a half lakh employees, which would be, mean at least half a million people, you have to spin a tail once too often. So that's where the India Post tale comes, a tale that is also recent of only 160 years. So again, the challenge is how do you keep an organization that's just 160 years young feel younger. So 
I thought the best part of that would be to introduce that the hotel that you're in, the Taj, that came as a symbol of Indian pride in the year 1903 by Jamshed Ji Tata and his young boy, of course, when I have taken his story, he was not so young, read, as you see, gentlemen, I am but a postman, which means a person as reputable as J.R.D. Tata had this emotional connect with the postman. And he says, it is no exaggeration. In the old days, it was my job to deliver the mails because he was the person who pioneered the first airline industry in India vis-a-vis -vis the Tata Airlines. That, his first flight was in 1932. So that is the emotional con you know, connect every Indian has with the quintessential post office because the postman, as you know, is not only a man who has delivered mails and India, which is even today predominantly rural, 60% of my population stay in the hinterlands. I wouldn't say rural India anymore because the urban-rural divide has really blurred. So I would say the hinterlands are not so congested cities. He is not only a person who delivers mails, he is a major source of change vis-a-vis -vis rural financial inclusion, but he is also your psychological counselor. Because unlike many countries, we do not have therapists, dime a dozen. So when you need therapy in rural India, you call your postman and seek therapy. So that has been the job, you know, the old traditional job of the postman. I just wanted to connect because I was, you know, addressing a forum of East Africans. So I was just connecting that in 1913, the great, you know, the independence or the first um, stance for independence in Kenya with Mekatilili Wawenza, a simple Kenyan woman who stood up against the colonial might. Similarly, in 1913, we had the great British might bringing up the Mumbai GPO by John Begg. So colonial histories, I wanted to just draw a parallel. And remember, the workers were Indians. The architect was a Scottish gentleman, John Begg, who was the guru or the professor of the person who made your young Gateway of India, because Gateway started in the year 1911 and ended in 1923. And the funny part is that the British wanted to, because it came after the revolt, the first revolt, they wanted to build something that looked Indian, kept Indian money, and yet was, you know, somehow by the British architects. So it was not built by the Indian. The labor class was Indians who again stood up and revolt later on. So India Post uh, funnily has woven the colonial history alongside the current India. I would again say that uh, the East African postal history is very similar to the Indian postal history because both of them had colonial roots vis-a-vis -vis the East India Company for us and the Imperial British East Africa Company that started in Kenya, mostly in Mombasa and Lamu. And in the year 1890 was the first postal system that came up in Kenya for the spreading to Mozambique, Uganda, South Africa. And if you see, the fun part is, during an acute shortage of stamps in August and September 1890 in Kenya, which was the first postal system, stamps of British India, or then East India, had been taken, postmarked Mombasa and Lamu and used in East Africa. So that is a connect that, you know, you have collectors who have a stamp that was printed in Indian Mint, postmarked Mombasa and Lamu, and used as a postal surcharge in East Africa. So coming to again, as I say, we are the world's largest postal network. You know we are not the world's most populous country, but we have a network that far beats, you know, we come number two in population, but in China, there is only 40,000 post offices, and in India, we serve about 1.5 lakh post offices. So that is our service obligation towards going to every person in our rural hinterland. 
Thank you very much. I brought this up because, you know, I wanted to show that we are always relevant with the sociocultural milieu of the country and this we are commemorating as all of you are also commemorating 150 years of the Mahatma, Mahatma Gandhi, father of the nation. So we've had different schemes that letters posted in this letterbox, a letterbox you know, in different places in this country would be provided a pictorial cancellation of the charkha. That is how we make ourselves a little popular, a little collectible oriented. Uh, we have, uh, unlike a lot of people who think that we have frozen in time, no, we have been reinventing ourselves. Yes, since we are a complete government department, we have not felt the need, which is definitely our pitfall, to speak much about ourselves. So, thank you, ITME, for the opportunity to hear about India Post and to hear about what have we been, you know, undergoing the challenges and the reinvention, so we reinvented ourselves vis-a-vis -vis our logo also. In 2008, we came up with a new logo that represented the new India Post. It is, let me just, uh, you know, it's very interesting because there is a square, a red envelope, because that is who we are. We are in the male's business, and we have two, three ticks that looks like ticks. They're actually supposed to be the flying doves because pigeon and doves have been the erstwhile messengers of communication in India. We've used the colors red and yellow. A, that you, uh, I do not know how many of you know that in India there is a color called the post office red. Actually, that's, that's, that's how relevant or that's how much in your lives the post office is, you know. So you can actually go to a shop and buy a post office red. Red symbolifies power, confidence, progress, the wish to go ahead. And yellow is of peace, happiness, hope. So that's what, and, and, red is vermilion, and yellow is turmeric. So it's again a part of, you know, intertwined in our culture. That's what our logo is. It talks about dynamic organization, serving the public, wanting to go ahead. The pigeon to post story, because often we are said that we are stuck in the pigeon era or snail mail era. I have heard of that all. I do not believe in that. So the journey actually, you know, we've had, uh, we are a 5,000 year old civilization. The journey, we have had references to communication in our great ancient texts, especially Meghdutam by Kalidasa about how, you know, the love of one's heart. I, it, he says that the love should be like, you know, you, you tell the clouds and the clouds be your messengers. So we've had always a way of giving messages. We still have them. Yes, you have the Instagrams and the Snapchats. But a formal network came up right back in the Indus Valley civilization. The network then was about people carrying your mail, but it was dependent on the weight and the distance. It kept on seeing different, you know, um, it, it uh, went through modifications and the current network that you see of postmen delivering mail fructified, of course, in Sesha Suri's time and then the Mughal times because nothing comes out of a vacuum. So when the East India came in, company came in, they took it from the Mughal times ahead. They, of course, you know, again, put a little technology of those times and that's what the system stands. So it has not risen out of a vacuum. It's always been there. It just became fructified and it came up during the East India Company's time. It was set up more so to control communication in India after the revolt, the 1857 revolt. The communication, the train networks and the postal networks were laid down so that messages the British would not find themselves isolated in pockets. So they set it up as a faster means of communication so, so that they could control communication and control revolts in the country. So these are a few shapes. The first post office in India was established in Mumbai itself in 1764. It was an isolated post office. It did not yet do any kind of networking. And the post it stamps. In fact, India has a big... Uh, big, big uh, significance in world philatelic history. In, uh, and she, as Seema said, that if you would have looked at your own stamps, we put up a series of postal stamps, uh, which um, salutes textiles and uh, everything textiles, because whatever you name, we have a stamp. So the first postal stamp in India came up in 1852 in the name of Sindh Dark. It was a postmarked, a merchant's mark of the East India Company. It's a collectible, it's very rare. 
this is after the British Post, Roland Hill set it up, the Penny Black, so that's been our contribution and role. A few important facts, we have 1.55 lakh post offices and we have six and a half lakh villages in India. So that is the reach. So each post office covers about 28 square kilometers of Indian land and about 9,000 people. That is the reach of India Post. We, have, we are the second biggest employers ever after railways in India. So no company beats us vis-a-vis -vis our manpower. I know. We, are happy, we boast of the world's highest post office in Hikkim, in Himachal Pradesh, which only has the post office. So it is exactly, I mean, that is how much we are dedicated to be a far-reaching service. We have the world's only flo floating post office and many other world's first. These are, you know, important facts that I want to say. I just put these up. So even in Antarctica, you know, uh, I was reading about what does a male signify? The male signifies man's conquest of something. So when Apollo 11 landed on the moon, do you know that the orbiter had 3,000 letters in transit on the moon, written by American people, so that it ever came back, it would say that yes, Americans landed on the moon. So that is how male has always been emotional. It has also signified, you know, territorial conquest because that was also territorial conquest, man and the moon. So, so we have our post offices in Antarctica. We set up the first mission in uh, Dakshin Gangotri. We have in Maitri. And 10,000 letters have been posted from Antarctica that have reached the mainland, signifying, you know, when you say the emotional connect, this is the emotional connect. This is how you feel about a letter even today. Though, though I always say that it's India Post because we have been in the business of Post, but we are much beyond that. We'll come to that later. We also have a service called the Army Postal Service, which was set up in 1856. We have two base stations. This is for the Army and the troop movement. We have one in Kolkata and we have one in Delhi. How is this important? Not only does mails, not only it does insurance, because every soldier of the Indian Army is insured by something called the postal life insurance, among others. So we are the biggest insurers vis-a-vis -vis government sector. But what does the Army Postal Service actually do? It knows your troop movements. So we work very close with the military intelligence about your troop movements. And since, as I said, 28 square kilometers has a post office. Whenever there is intrusions, it is first reported by the postmaster, not by any, you know, patrolling officer, because as you know, border posts shut down during the cold seasons. A post office never shuts down. So whenever there is any intrusion in the big Indian frontier that we have, it is known by the post office system and that is how Indian Army and the Postal Network work very close tandem to each other. And the entire, so if you have to write a letter to any soldier, you do not know his address because they're often posted in forward posts. So you just send it to Base Camp Post Office 1 or Base Camp Post Office 2 and that is all the family knows. And the rest is done by immense amount of, you know, postal networks that go. They are on deputation from the India Post and also a few from the Army, Army Services Corps. So that is the reach also of India Post. They've had their own logo of a flying swan, again, you know, a messenger. So this is a few things that I added out. So Siachen Glacier, we have an Army Post Command open all the year round. The, uh, the Postal Post Command, the Army Command shuts down during the cold season, but the post office is not shut down. History again, India, the mother of airmail service. So when you talk about airmail, it is not from any, you know, industrialized West. It is again from India. It happened in 1911, February 18th, by a young French a pilot, Henri Piquet. During the Kumbh Mela, it is a religious festival in India. It, he flew from the Allahabad, somewhere in central India, because I would not say the names. We have foreign dignitaries. So that was the first airmail service, which was then carried away by across the world. So we've even then had sea mail. 
and the railway mail and uh, indians and the young students who are here uh, you would be hearing trains in the name of bomb howrah mail bombay mail kalka mail this were trains that carried mail that is why they were known as mail trains and not you know so when i joined the services i always knew how to mail because i traveled from kolkata to bombay i had no idea that they were named because they carried mail so every compartment was you know there was a compartment that was booked so that is how you got the mail trains which were the faster trains than the normal passenger trains that was how much value india post has always had in the psyche of india and then you ask me this question what is the relevance of india post so i think a little more education would be good <laughs> i'm sorry so, yeah so i've given you a few, a few facts we've also had the sea mail during the british times which sent mail to great britain and china because china was again that important trade post in the colonial british raj we've had post we we have post offices and our operation offices that work 7 days and 24 hours so they do not shut ever the airport tmos the transit mail hubs the railway mail hubs continuously working the post offices work 6 days but the transit mail offices 24 hours 7 days now coming to e-commerce yes it is true that mails have fallen you do not write letters we are aware there's a 10% mail fall across the world including us so how do postal services survive they survive because youngsters have refused to go to the malls to buy stuff they want to click 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 that's the e-commerce portal so even when you click and you buy you need somebody to physically take your parcel from x destination to y destination and parcel business has grown across the world to the rate of 5 to 7% so that is the reinvention india post you know we cannot change our name from the post but our post today does not mean writing letters so again when people ask me what do you do nobody write letters yeah ji thank you i do know nobody write letters but people do carry you know parcels we do that we carry your parcels that you so conveniently click, click on your computers so we've had a website i've just given you a few figures and in india if you are successful everything is millions of dollars so you know you can just read these figures yourself because it's a huge country whatever we do we earn a lot of money so we have also gone completely online we our entire systems are not ma it's just it's gone online including our banking network i'll come to that a little later so it's track and trace so when you book a mail it is not only transited online except of course the manual transmission but you can do a track and trace we have reinvented we've gone suave i've just put a slide to show you about that so you when you put a letter in a letter box you have automated mail processing centers who from your pin code pick up scan it make a qr code and scan your mails and sort it so it's not the good old postman who does the sorting anymore it is huge machines that do the sorting and they send the mails for a faster transit and delivery we have the biggest bank of the country I, that is what i would like to say that we've had we have the biggest bank of the country we have like i said 1.55 banking units because every post office is a bank and our nearest competitor is the state bank of india with about 40000 branches so that's how we beat our you know nearest competitor yes we have a if you say that you're not swanky as a bank we do not want to be swanky because when a normal man from our hinterland comes to a post office he feels comfortable he feels that he has and our minimum balances are very low so as to bring the unbanked sector into a banking network thereby we guarantee people who are unbanked as you know the same condition for africa a lot of people more so women do not come from a banking organization they do not have banking accounts so you have to do a financial inclusion the world bank report says that india post has a you know the best performance getting the hitherto unbanked class to the banking sector and giving them helping them 
away from financial exploitation. We have last year launched our own bank. So we have two banking networks, one that we run as an agency of the Finance Ministry of India, from which we get agency function charges, which is a savings bank. And we also last year launched a payments bank for small payments, which eventually we plan to do a microfinance bank, because again, uh, I do not know if uh, people, students from Bombay are aware that often in rural India, when you talk about farmer debts, the debts happen because the debts pile up. A small, per, a small loan is often repaid back. It's the huge loans that do not get repaid back. So we are planning because of our network to open a small finance bank. Then we come, of course, like I said, we're a colonial past, so we have 36 uh, heritage buildings, uh, each of them fantastic pieces of work. Uh, tomorrow you are invited. I think there's a group, Seema, that's coming in to have a heritage walk in Mumbai GPO. You're most welcome. You will see the grandeur of heritage walks alongside a working post office because India Post has not made museums of these buildings. They are older than your museums. Bombay GPO is older than the Chhatrapati Shivaji Museum, but it is a living post office where people work. So, you know, I open my doors to you. Please come and have a look at the grandeur of all of it. I bring you to Philately. What is philately? People say it's the collection of and study of posted stamps. Philately actually means out of the gutter. Gutter. Gutter is a term, technical term. It's the distance between two adhesive stamps. And you know gutter is the mental block. So in older days, when, you know, also Google Guru was not around, stamps were a medium of understanding the world. So they got you out of the gutter. So that is why the word philately said, out of the gutter, away from the morass of general living and a little enlightenment. So stamps are perhaps the most suave and silent documenters of history. Give it any subject. I just uh, concluded a superbug exhibition in Nehru Science Center, and then I've put up a textile stamp exhibition. So that is, you know, we, we have stamps of everything in the country across the world because whatever is important in a country's history be it geographic history political history social cultural history arts crafts literature you have stamps on it you know that is how they document what is happening in every decade and every year and you can have a passage of information through stamps you can just read, this was uh, 1840. I just put a few, you know, historical facts about stamps. I would like to say, which is bring out about India's most costliest stamps. The iconic 10 rupee Gandhi stamp in 1948 was launched after independence. 47 was our independence. And it was stamped with a service overprint. As you see, the service overprint on the stamp there. the service overprint, right? It was issued for the use of the Governor General of India, making it the world's least printed stamps. It only has 200 specimens. It is a very expensive stamp to, to trade. So if anybody of you has a stamp in your, uh, you know, grandfather's album, for sure sell it. It'll, it will make you a millionaire. Even after 70 years later, the 10 rupees edition of the 1948 Gandhi stamp is a real gem. 18 examples are known. It was 200 were printed, 18 survive. A strip of four rare 10 rupee Gandhi stamp was sold for record 500,000 pounds at Stanley Gibson auction in 2007. So, who collects stamps? Don't collect it, please. Don't be rich. The Forana stamp, I'm again talking about the rare Indian stamp, the Forana stamp, bicolored lithograph stamp, issued in 1854 with the head of the queen accidentally printed upside down, is regarded as the costliest Indian stamp. This stamp, popularly known as the inverted head, is the world's first invert error because we were the second printing, you know, stamp printing country. So it would be the world's first error. Only about 28 copies of the stamp are known to exist. The value of the stamp is $100,000. The 
we have uh, again people who are coming to Mumbai GPO. We have decided that we will make ourselves a little more popular vis a vis the youngsters. So we have something called a My Stamp. So you can go down to the GPO, our many philatelic bureaus, take your photograph and have a stamp of your own self that is a usable stamp. Fe feel free, come down to the bureau, come down to visit the romance in the world of stamps. I think there's a lot, lot more you can learn about not only stamps, not only, you know, what we do in India Post about your own country. You deserve that. Thank you very much. Ask any questions or have any interaction? Uh, Mike, I, yeah. can, I, can an, I can answer a few questions about Indian textiles. Um, <laughs> uh, out of common knowledge, a missionary zero. So, hello. Yes. Hello. Yes. 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 Uh, what do you think future of post office? The way things are happening. I said parcel, okay. parcel. That is the future of post office. Okay. And the banks, because in India, you need financial inclusion. Uh, your big banks are not doing enough. And uh, I feel that uh, you need to bank the unbanked sector. You need to give them that kind of, you know, cover, financial cover. So um, parcels and banks, yes. Do you have any plans to use your existing logistic structure for some, some other services as well? We do for every service. In fact, we have a MOU with the Ministry of External Affairs. You can come to select post offices and have your passports done. You can, yeah, yeah. We have a passport service. Then Aadhaar. We are the biggest proponents of Aadhaar in the country. You can come and make your Aadhaar, update your Aadhaar. As you know that you have a, mand if you know or do not know, you have a mandatory Aadhaar updation at age 5 and age 15. So if you have children who have not updated the Aadhaar, please walk down to the nearest post office. I'm a big marketeer, but beyond that, so yes, the government leverages Aadhaar with us, the passports with us. We do a multiple outreach activities for other ministries of the government. That is how much they believe in our network. Because like I said, 28 square kilometers to one post office. You will not find anybody there. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. I remember collecting first day covers. Yes. Do you still yes, uh, print yes. them for yes. all stamps or yes. only for some stamps? We print them for all commemorative postage stamps. In fact, anybody who's interested in Philately, there is a IMPEX India Philately exhibition being organized by the Philately Congress of India, that is not India Post, in World Trade Center right now. Please go and have a look. They have championship class displays, really good displays. So if anybody has been a person who's interested in Philately, World Philately, please come, walk down to the World Trade Center and have a look. I wanted to ask you, what's the relevance of stamps in today's world? Uh, I would say that stamps uh, are the, you know, um, a fun way of learning in today's world because in every textbook you have photographs, right? You could also have a stamp there because stamps, remember, document your own history. So, whenever the country feels, believes, commemorates something, you have a stamp. In fact, I always say, if there's something important, stamp it. That's what Seema is doing tonight. Because of your function or your meat being important, you are having a release of a stamp. So, whatever has been important in every country, not only in India, they have a stamp commemorating it. So, you know, go ahead and stamp history. That's the importance of stamps. They document your history and they teach you about it. Thank you. Now, I just, first of all, like to make a remark. Thank you for this very interesting uh, Thank presentation. You. Thank you very much. And it was very good to see that you are doing Industry 4.0. You know, you've got these e-commerce, you've got automation scanning, and you've got even individualization with the My Stamp. But I just got a simple, practical question. Yes. How much letters do, uh, how much uh, will cost a letter to Germany and how much time will it take? Regular letter. Uh, right, right. See, uh, a regular letter that you're doing through ordinary post, yes. I think should reach Germany within uh, four days' time. Four days. And yeah. it will be cost how much? The uh, normal letter costing would be about, how much, Kia? Normal letter. Normal letter. Yeah. 50, okay. That's right. But if you have a speed, if you do it through EMS, yeah, it, it goes in three days' time. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank, thank you. Hello. Yeah, we have different categories of mail. 
you have an ordinary just an ordinary mail that you can uh, you know put it on the mail it's just 50 paisa that the government puts it for the outreach but yeah that's technical you're not interested hello last question when we see a postman we think of old old days do you have any efforts to train them or come out with some different uh, training programs uh, for them sir you've asked me a very wrong question i'm very caustic in my remarks you know, um, when you say that, uh, you, when you see a postman, you think of old, maybe that's because you are old yourself. <laughs> because have you seen a postman recently? He roams around with a smartphone, with an app downloaded. He delivers, exactly. Oh, there's a young man here somewhere. Great, thank you very much. Yeah, he scans your mail. He does not take a signature. He scans, your, you know, you sign it through an e-pen and he uploads it into the track and trace right at your house. He opens your post office bank at your house. He gives you money at your house. You tell me he's old? Not, My at, postman? All. Not at all. My perception is old maybe. Thank you very much. I think, oh, you would like. Absolutely, please. Allowed us as foreigners here. Can I get a my stamp? Absolutely. I am waiting for you tomorrow. Please come down. We will, you know, in fact, there's so much more that you would discover about us. We have a lovely building. We have the second biggest, you know, tomb of the country. Our tomb is the second biggest tomb in the country. So please come down. You'll, we'll open the, you know, our hearts to you. Okay. Yes, you can have your stamp. Thank you. Have I earned my free lunch for the day? <laughs> Thank you. Ma'am, you have earned more than free lunch. You have won our hearts. You have earned our respect, not only for yourself, but also for the whole of Postal Department. We feel <laughs> proud. We have uh, uh, students from various universities who have attended the lecture of Professor Gloy and uh, I would request the students with their first name starting with A alphabet and to line up and receive their certificates for attending this technical session.
All right. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, as you can see, uh, I stand between you and a sumptuous lunch today, so I won't take too long. But uh, I've been given the pleasant task of uh, summing up the proceedings of a very interesting morning. And uh, I think as, as we came in today morning, all of us were a little uh, you know, curious about how the day is going to turn out. But I think uh, the morning's uh, proceedings have been, uh, if I can sum up, uh, a wonderful, wonderfully diverse, but uh, unified, uh, uh, you know, uh, informatory event. Uh, first of all, uh, I'd like to, uh, you know, uh, and it's 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 very heartening to see the stakeholders representing the entire textile industry industry doens, entrepreneurs from various parts of India and around the world, academics, students, consultants, associations, representatives from the UN, and last but not the least, an eminent legal luminary. Uh, to your brief uh, uh, presentation about uh, Moi University, and I can assure you that our chairman, who is also a marathon runner, uh, will be paying a visit to Moy University pretty soon uh, and adding his name to all the uh, famous uh, runners that have originated from Eldorat. Yeah, thank you very much again. Um, and last but not the least, Ms. Swati Pandey, right, for spinning a wonderful tale connecting the postal services of India and East Africa, particularly Kenya, and introducing us to a revitalized postal service. There were many things that we really weren't aware of or probably our information about the postal service was outdated. Thank you very much for waking us up. Yeah, and I, I, I remember my uh, at a very small age, uh, my father introducing me to his postal stamp collection. And for me, that was a wonderful window to the outside world where you could see stamps of different countries, of different shapes, different sizes, different images. I think it was a wonderful world. And it's sad to see that uh, the relevance of stamps apparently in our minds have gone down. But it's also heartening to know that there is a very uh, small but uh, enthusiastic community of uh, philatelists, stamp collectors, who you know still not, uh, uh, I mean, uh, still follow this uh, hobby uh, with a wonderful passion. Uh, also, I think the uh, I, I must I must look back on my dad's collection and see if I have that service stamp uh, there. I mean, you know, maybe that might you know kind of bring a few hundred thousand dollars or euros. Yeah. Uh, that there was an army postal service dedicated solely to the army was also something new that uh, I learned today. Uh, very interesting facts about today's postal service. Thank you very much and I think we all should look forward to tomorrow's visit to uh, the GPO. How many times have we passed by the GPO and wondered, what a wonderful building, why can't we go and look around and what better opportunity than to have the Postmaster General herself hosting us tomorrow. I would like to encourage you all to take advantage uh, as many as possible. I, I hope we won't be overloading you. But uh, uh, please, uh, this, this, I mean, these opportunities don't come often. So all in all, I think it's been a very eventful morning. I'd like to thank you all very much for being here early enough and uh, uh, invite you to join us for lunch. And also in the afternoon, we have some very interesting sessions. Thank you very much once again, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of uh, Mr. Harishankar, Chairman of India Etme Society, Seema, and her team at India Etme Society. Thank you very much again. <laughs>